The question is, is how to now adjourn? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, the House meets this Saturday to respond to a situation of great gravity. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. After several days of rising tension in our relations with Argentina, that country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control of the islands. Mr. Speaker, yesterday was a day of rumour and counter-rumour. Throughout the day, we had no communication from the government of the Falklands. Indeed, the last message we received was at 25, 21, 55 hours on Thursday night, the 1st of April. Yesterday morning at 8.33 a.m., we sent a telegram. At 8... <laughs> which was acknowledged at 8.45 a.m. all communications ceased. I will refer again to this in a moment. By late afternoon yesterday, it became clear that an Argentine invasion had taken place and that the lawful British government of the islands had been usurped. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the whole House will join me in condemning totally this unprovoked aggression by the government of Argentina against British territory. It has not a shred of justification and not a scrap of legality. Mr Speaker, it was not until 8.30 this morning, our time, when I was able personally to speak to the governor who had arrived in Uruguay that I learned precisely what had happened. He told me that the Argentines had landed at approximately 6 a.m. Falklands time, 10 a.m. our time. One party attacked the capital from the landward side and another from the seaward side. The governor then sent a signal to us, which we did not receive. Communications, of course, had ceased at 8.45 our time. It is common for atmospheric conditions to make communications with Port Stanley difficult. Indeed, we, have been out of, we had been out of contact for a period the previous night. The Governor reported that the Marines, in, his defense of government, in the defence of Government House, were superb. They acted, he said, in the best tradition of the Royal Marines. They inflicted casualties but those defending Government House suffered none. He himself had kept the local people informed of what was happening through a small local transmitter he had in Government House. He is relieved that the islanders heeded his advice to stay indoors. Fortunately, as far as he is aware, there were no civilian casualties. When he left the Falklands, he said the people were in tears. They do not want to be Argentine. He said the islanders are still tremendously loyal. I must say that I have every confidence in the governor and the action he took. I must tell the House that the Falkland Islands and their dependencies remain British territory. No aggression and no invasion can alter that simple fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a government's objective to see that the islands are freed from occupation and are returned to British administration yeah, yeah, yeah. at the earliest possible moment. 
Mr. Speaker, Argentina has, of course, long disputed British sovereignty over the islands. But we have absolutely no doubt about our sovereignty, which has been continuous since 1833. Nor have we any doubt about the unequivocal wishes of the Falkland Islanders, who are British in stock and tradition, and they wish to remain British in allegiance. We cannot allow the democratic rights of the islanders to be denied by the territorial ambitions of Argentina. Over the past 15 years, successive British governments have held a series of meetings with the Argentine government to discuss the dispute. In many of these meetings, elected representatives of the islanders have taken part. We have always made it clear that their wishes were paramount, and that there would be no change in sovereignty without their consent and without the approval of this House. The most recent meeting took place this year in New York at the end of February between my honourable friend the member for Shoreham, accompanied by two members of the Islands Council and the Deputy Foreign Secretary of Argentina. The atmosphere at the meeting was cordial and positive and a communique was issued about future negotiating procedures. Unfortunately, the joint communique which had been agreed was not published in Buenos Aires. There was indeed a good deal of bellicose comment in the Argentine press in late February and early March, about which my honourable friend, the Minister of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, expressed his concern in this House on the 3rd of March, following the Anglo-Argentine talks in New York. This has not, however, been an uncommon situation in Argentina over the years, and it would have been absurd to dispatch the fleet every time there was bellicose... Every time there was bellicose talk in Buenos Aires, there was no good reason to think on the 3rd of March that an invasion was being planned, especially against the background of the constructive talks which my honourable friend, on which my honourable friend had just been engaged and to which the joint communique on behalf of the Argentine Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs with my honourable friend read, the meeting took place in a cordial and positive spirit. The two sides reaffirmed their resolve to find a solution to the sovereignty dispute and continue, considered in detail an Argentine proposal for procedures to make better progress in this sense. There had, of course, been previous incidents affecting sovereignty before the one in South Georgia, to which I shall refer in a moment. In December 1976, the Argentinians illegally set up a scientific station on one of the dependencies within the Falklands group, Southern Thule. The last government attempted to solve the matter through diplomatic exchanges, but without success. The Argentinians remained there and are still there. Two weeks ago, on the 19th of March, the latest in this series of incidents affecting sovereignty occurred, and the deterioration in relations between the British and Argentinian governments, which culminated in yesterday's Argentinian invasion, began. The incident appeared at the start to be relatively minor, but we now know that it was the beginning of much more. The commander of the British Antarctic Survey Base at Gridviken on South Georgia, a dependency of the Falkland Islands over which the United Kingdom has exercised sovereignty since 1775, when the island was discovered by Captain Cook, reported to us that an Argentine Navy cargo ship had landed about 60 Argentines at nearby Leith Harbour. They had set up camp and hoisted the Argentine flag. They were there to carry out a valid commercial contract to remove scrap metal from a former whaling station. The leader of the commercial expedition, Davidoff, had told our embassy in Buenos Aires that he would be going to South Georgia in March. He was reminded of the need to obtain permission from the immigration authorities of the island. He did not do so. <coughs> The base commander told the Argentines that they had no right to land on South Georgia without the permission of the British authorities. They should go either to Gridviken to get the necessary clearances or leave. The ship and some 50 of them left on the 22nd of March. 
and although about 10 Argentinians remained behind, this appeared to reduce the tension. In the meantime, we had been in touch with the Argentine government about the incident. They claimed to have had no prior knowledge of the landing and assured us there were no Argentinian mil military personnel in the party. For our part, we made it clear that while we had no wish to interfere in the operation of a normal commercial contract, we could not accept the illegal presence of these people on British territory. We asked the Argentine government either to arrange for the departure of the remaining men or to ensure that they obtained the necessary permission to be there. Because we recognised the potentially serious nature of the situation, HMS Endurance was ordered to the area. We told the Argentine government that if they failed to regularise the position of the party on South Georgia or to arrange for their departure, HMS Endurance would take them off without using force and return them to Argentina. This was, however, to be a last resort. We were determined that this apparently minor problem of 10 people on South Georgia in pursuit of a commercial contract should not be allowed to escalate and we made it plain to the Argentine government that we wanted to achieve a peaceful resolution of the problem by diplomatic means. To help in this, HMS Endurance was ordered not to approach the Argentine party at least, but to go to Gritviken. It soon became clear that the Argentine government had little interest in trying to solve the problem. On the 25th of March, another Argentine Navy ship arrived at Lis to deliver supplies to the 10 men ashore. Our ambassador in Buenos Aires sought an early response from the Argentine government to our previous requests that they should arrange for the men's departure. This request was refused. Last Sunday, on Sunday the 28th of March, the Argentine Foreign Minister sent a message to my noble friend, the Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary, refusing outright to regularise the men's position. Instead, it restated Argentina's claim to sovereignty over the Falkland Islands and their dependencies. My noble friend, the Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary, then sent a message to the United States Secretary of State asking him to intervene and to urge restraint. By the beginning of this week, it was clear that our efforts to solve the South Georgia dispute through the usual diplomatic channels were getting nowhere. Therefore, on Wednesday the 31st of March, my noble friend the Foreign Secretary proposed to the Argentine Foreign Minister that we should dispatch a special emissary to Buenos Aires. Later that day, we received information which this was Wednesday, which led us to believe that a large number of Argentine ships, including an aircraft carrier, destroyers, landing craft, troop carriers and submarines, were heading for Port Stanley. I contacted President Reagan that evening and asked him to intervene with the Argentine president directly. We promised in the meantime to take no action to escalate the dispute for fear of precipitating the very event. For fear of precipitating the very event that our efforts were directed to avoid. May I remind honourable gentlemen opposite What happened when, during the lifetime of their government, Southern Thule was occupied? It was occupied in 1976. This house was not even informed by the then government until 1978. This House was not even informed until 1978, when in response to questioning by my honourable friend, the member for Shoreham, on the 24th of May 1978, the honourable member for Merthyr Tidville said, we have sought to resolve the issue through diplomatic exchanges between the two governments. 
that is infinitely preferable to public denunciations and public statements when we are trying to achieve a practical result to the problem that has arisen. It would seem... Poland. We are talking about a piece of rock in the most southerly part of the dependencies, totally uninhabited, and smelling of large amounts of accumulation of both penguin and, and, bird, and bird droppings. There's a vast difference, a whole world of difference, yeah. between, yeah. 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 between, between, between 1,800 people now imprisoned by Argentine invaders yeah. and that argument. Yeah. And right under the lady ought to be grace to accept it. We are talking about the sovereignty of British territory, which was, which was infringed in 1976, about which this House was not even informed until 1978. We are talking then about a further incident which this House was not even informed until 1978. We are talking then about a further incident in South Georgia, which as I have indicated, seemed to be a minor incident at the time. There's only a British Antarctic scientific survey which is there, and a commercial contract to remove a whaling station. I suggest to the honourable gentleman that had at that time I come to the House and said, we have a problem on South Georgia with 10 people who have landed with a contract to remove a whaling station. Had I then gone on to say that we should send Invincible, I should have been accused of warmongering and save a Information did not arrive about the Argentine fleet until Wednesday. They are, of course, very close to the Falklands, which the Honourable Gentle cannot and must not ignore, and can sail and reach there very quickly. Mr Speaker, on Thursday, the Argentine Foreign Minister rejected the idea of an emissary and told our Ambassador that the diplomatic channel as a means of solving this dispute was closed. President Reagan had a very long telephone conversation, some 50 minutes, with the Argentine President, but his strong representations fell on deaf ears. I am grateful to him and Secretary Haig for their strenuous and persistent efforts on our behalf. Thirdly on Thursday, the United Nations Secretary General, Mr Perez de Cuela, summoned both British and Argentine permanent representatives to urge both countries to refrain from the use or threat of force in the South Atlantic. Later that evening, we sought an emergency meeting of the Security Council. We accepted the appeal of its president for restraint. The Argentines said nothing. On Friday, as the House knows, the Argentines invaded the Falklands, and I have given a precise account of everything we knew or did not know about that situation. There were also reports that, yes, that yesterday the Argentines also attacked South Georgia, where HMS Endurance had left a detachment of 22 Royal Marines. Our information is that on 2nd of April, an Argentine naval transport vessel informed the base commander at Gridviken that an important message would be passed to him after 11 o'clock today, our time. It is assumed that this message will ask the base commander to surrender. Mr Speaker, before indicating some of the measures the government has taken in response to the Argentinian invasion, I would like to make three points. First, even if ships had been instructed to sail the day the Argentinians landed on South Georgia to clear the whaling station. The ships could not possibly have got to Port Stanley before the invasion. <laughs> Honourable members may not like it, but that is fact. Second, <laughs> second there have been several occasions in the past when an invasion has been threatened. The only way of being certain to prevent an invasion would have been to keep a very large fleet 
close to the Falklands some eight th when we are some 8,000 miles away from base. No government has ever been able to do that, and the cost would be enormous. Thirdly, endurance is in the area. It is not for me to say precisely where, and, and the honourable gentleman would not wish me to say precisely where. Thirdly, Mr Speaker, aircraft unable to land on the Falklands because of the frequently changing weather would have had little fuel left and ironically their only hope of landing safely would have been to divert to Argentina. Indeed, all of the air and most sea supplies for the Falklands come from Argentina, which is but 400 miles away compared with our 8,000 miles. This is the background, Mr. Speaker, against which we have to make decisions and to consider what action we could best take. I cannot tell the House precisely what dispositions have been made. Some ships are already at sea. Others were put on immediate alert on Thursday evening. The Government has now decided that a large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. HMS Invincible will be in the lead and will leave port on Monday. I stress that I cannot foretell what orders the task force will receive as they proceed. That will depend on the situation at the time. Meanwhile, we hope that our continuing diplomatic efforts, helped by our many friends, will meet with success. Mr. Speaker, the foreign ministers of the European Community member states yesterday condemned the intervention and urged withdrawal. The NATO Council called on both sides to refrain from force and continue diplomacy. The United Nations Security Council met again yesterday and will continue with this discussion today. Honourable members opposite love. They would have been the first to urge for a meeting of the Security Council, but we had not in fact called on. They would have been the first to urge restraint and to solve it by diplomatic means. They would have been the first to urge us of sabre rattling and warmongering. We are now, Mr. Speaker. Order. The Prime Minister is, is already addressing the House. Is, is she giving way? Mr. Tom Diel. Referred to our many friends. Do we have any friends in South America itself on this issue? Mr. Speaker, doubtless our friends in South America will make their views known during any proceedings at the Security Council. I believe that many countries in South America will be prepared to condemn the invasion of the Falkland Islands by force. Mr. Speaker, we are now reviewing all aspects of the relationship between Argentina and the United Kingdom. The Argentine Chargé Affair and his staff were yesterday instructed to leave within four days. As an appropriate precautionary and, I hope, temporary measure, the Government has taken action to freeze Argentine financial assets held in this country. An order will be laid before Parliament today under the Emergency Laws Reenactments and Repeals Act 1964, blocking the movement of gold, securities or funds held in the United Kingdom by the Argentine Government or Argentine residents. As a further precautionary measure, ECGD has suspended new export credit cover for the Argentine. It is, of course, the government's earnest wish that a return to good sense and the normal rules of international behaviour on the part of the Argentine government will obviate the necessity for action across the full range of economic relations. But we shall be reviewing the situation and we shall be ready to take further steps which we deem appropriate and will, of course, report to the House. Mr. Speaker, the people of the Falkland Islands, like the people of the United Kingdom, are an island race. Their way of life is British, their allegiance is to the Crown. They are few in number, but they have the right to live in peace, to choose their own way of life, and to determine their own allegiance. Their way of life is British, their allegiance is to the Crown. It is the wish of the British people and the duty of Her Majesty's Government to do everything we can to uphold that right. 
That will be our hope and our endeavour, and I believe the resolve of every honourable member of this House. Yeah.